everyone. Um, my name is Renee Kirby. I'm the parent coordinator at Maryland School for the Blind. Um, today we have Neil Lichter, the program director from Pathfinders for Autism. And he's going to present the PowerPoint and let us know um, what's available on their website. And I'm just going to let him take it from here. Great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thanks to Renee for reaching out. I'm glad to have the opportunity to be able to come out and share information. Uh, a little bit about who Pathfinders for Autism is right at the beginning, our housekeeping. We are going into our 20th year as a nonprofit uh, in the state of Maryland. We just cover the state of Maryland. Uh, and we were started 20 years ago by parents for parents as a way for families to be able to access resources that sometimes weren't as easy to find 20 years ago when the internet um, wasn't what it is today. So finding doctors or speech therapists was, was, can be done sometimes through your pediatrician or through where you're diagnosed, but trying to find a barber or a dentist uh, or a social skills group or a little league team or a church that is, is autism friendly or accessible for people with disabilities was often a lot tougher. So we started off as a way for families to, be, have, access, to have access to these resources. Uh, we've grown over the years we're based out of Hunt Valley, Maryland. There's all of eight of us that work there now. Uh, and we have a great resource center provider directory, which we're gonna take a walk through later, uh, that lets you search for what you're looking for um, uh, by, by, by your zip code to find a provider in our provider directory that has 3,500, 4,000 names in it, uh, and the tremendous amount of articles and information. Uh, we do workshops and trainings all over the state of Maryland, training anyone from pre-kindergarten kids all the way up through Maryland State Police, doctors and nurses, medical, stu medical school students, lifeguards, uh, counselors at camps, anybody who wants to know uh, a little bit more about working with individuals with autism spectrum. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what that means as we jump in uh, and go forward. So the last thing we do as our organization, sorry, I forgot the third thing, was we do free family fun events. So we understand sometimes going out uh, with a child who may struggle with sensory processing or communication uh, can be difficult to go to some place like the National Aquarium or the Science Center. Uh, what our organization will do is we rent out these facilities uh, on a Saturday night. We close them down and we open up again at 6.30. And from 6.30 to 10 o'clock, you're welcome to come in uh, and have a free run of the place. So if your child is loud or uh, melts down or flaps or screams or does any sort of um, you know, movements when they're excited or scared or happy, uh, you're not going to get any judgments or comments from families. Uh, it's a very welcoming environment. Uh, it lets parents of newly diagnosed children know that they're not alone on an island and that there's a lot of other people going through that. Uh, and it's a very family-friendly environment. So uh, I used Pathfinders as a resource uh, before I became an employee. Uh, I've been working for the organization for six years now, but uh, for the lab, for a few years before that, I was getting articles and information and resources and providers from the directory. Uh, I have a 15-year-old son named Max. Max is on the autism spectrum, uh, and Max's autism impacts him through communication and anxiety and behavior, and we'll talk a lot about that today. Um, but please remember that individuals on the autism spectrum are all unique and individualized, and it is by no means a cookie-cutter disorder. And so, uh, we'll we'll go ahead and roll through. So. Um, when I talk about autism being a spectrum disorder, there's, there's individuals who struggle with daily tasks and they're going to need uh, help throughout their lives who struggle with communication. Um, so I'm going to show you a quick video. Um, this is a video of my buddy Dev, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about Dev uh, after this quick video runs. So there goes Dev. Um, so some things when I, and this is the typical presentation I take around the state. So some things that we look for uh, and we have fa um, the audiences we talk to observe is, you know, uh, is Dev verbal or is he nonverbal? Well, Dev's pretty low verbal. He has some words, but in that video, uh, he was doing a lot of, um, you know, uh, babbling, talking. Um, uh, did, did, he, did he appear to be agitated? Did he appear to be relaxed? I know that he was sitting there stimming with his 
with his Live Strong bracelets that he loves. Uh, and when he starts to do that, he has a little bit of anxiety and that stimming you'll see some individuals on the autism spectrum do because it helps ease their anxiety to have that repetitive motion uh, going over and over again. Uh, we point out a lot of times to audiences, Dev looks you know, maybe 10 or 11 in that video. Uh, Dev is 15 in that video. Uh, he's a very frail uh, kid because he has some serious uh, gut reactions to the food that, 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 that he eats to the point where now his diet is sort of like a raw vegan diet because that seems to cause the least amount of disturbance uh, in his behaviors. Uh, but it's hard to have a kid thrive with just that diet. It's hard to get enough calories in. So that's one example of an individual who's on the autism spectrum, struggles uh, verbally, struggles with feeding, struggles with things like that. So all the way at that other end of when you call it a spectrum, uh, you think of the other end. And at the other end is sort of someone, an individual like Grant. Uh, so we'll run this video. It's a little bit longer. And then we can sort of talk about Grant. One time I was coming home and I saw this police car that was pulling out uh, from the left. But of course, I had the right of way, so I went by. But speed limit's uh, 50 miles an hour per hour, but you can go up to 55, you know, or maybe just 60, uh, but that's about it. But still, uh, when I saw the car, I, uh, I kind of slowed down a little bit and picked up. Uh, more of the speed, but then he started catching up with me. I saw him getting closer, so then that made me feel, oh no, is he pulling me over? Or am I going to be, uh, you know, am I in trouble? And so then I put on my uh, right blinker and uh, pulled over, and then uh, I saw the flashing lights then go on, and uh, he came up to me uh, and uh, he said, he asked me, why did you stop? And and I, I said, I, I, I thought maybe you wanted me to stop, I, because I saw him, you know, right behind me, so, uh, very close, almost right on my tail. And then I thought, um, so he asked me if I had too much to drink, and I, well, of course I didn't. And I, so I said no. And um, of course, he didn't know that he, that I had disabilities, and I didn't bring it up either. So I like to stop the video there. He does not get a ticket, by the way. The officer lets him go. Um, and I do a lot of presentations to police officers. And we, we talk about Grant as another individual who is diagnosed on the autism spectrum. So he and Devin have the same exact diagnosis. But clearly, there's, there's a world of difference between the way they're impacted uh, by their disability. And some of the things that we point out with Grant, um, wherever we go, and we, we show this video to lots of different audiences, is certainly he has plenty of language. Um, the eye contact is pretty minimal uh, with just the camera in the room. Uh, the anxiety for him starts to go up, even talking about the story, his hand shakes a little bit. Um, we ask police officers, you know, this is a gentleman who's pulled himself over on the side of the road just at the sight of your car, uh, and you, you decide to pull over behind him, and as you approach, he's not looking you in the eye, and does that light up red flags for police officers? Well, that's, you know, Sometimes that's something they worry about. Lack of eye contact could be inebriation or intoxication. And what we're trying to do with our trainings is this is an individual who struggles with eye contact uh, and may not be able to let you know that they're going to struggle with eye contact. So we don't want you to think of it as what may look like one thing a lot of times can lead, can be something caused by the disability. So where I stopped the video is when Grant says, you know, I didn't know if I should let him know and he didn't ask and we always recommend, listen, if you're going to request a reasonable accommodation, which is what is called for by the ADA, you have to sort of be able to accom uh, uh, advocate for that and let them know. And part of what we do is we, we help train uh, police officers, but we also run movies and classes where individuals with disabilities and autism and other uh, intellectual developmental disabilities are able to interact with police officers and law enforcement in a low anxiety environment. Um, so that you have some familiarity with what uh, the process may be like, or, or just give you some familiarity to help reduce that anxiety. But uh, Grant is a great guy, works as an audio technician in Frederick at a radio station, lives on his own, drives freely. Uh, very big rule follower, as you can hear. Um, you know, your car can go 50, 55, maybe just 60. Uh, of course, I wasn't drinking and driving. I put on my right turn signal and pulled over. Uh, Grant likes that 
concreteness in his life. There's an anxiety that's created by sort of not knowing what's next or the unknown uh, that a lot of people with autism have expressed to us. And, and my son feels the same way. He likes that concreteness of a schedule. He likes his day laid out. And that's part of helping him cope with the anxiety he feels um, by not having that structure in his day. So um, rule followers, uh, oftentimes literal thinkers, um, uh, are often individuals on the autism spectrum who struggle with some of their social skills rules and understanding language that people use. Um, I don't have any letters after my last name. Uh, this is a, not a clinical presentation, which is what I think makes it a very popular presentation for a lot of the places we go. Uh, this is as clinical as we get as to say, autism is a neurological development disorder affecting multiple areas of the brain and body, which as I said earlier, just means it's not cookie cutter. It's not the same on everybody. Not everybody with autism looks alike, sounds alike, is impacted the same way, is triggered by the same things, is, is aided, aided in de-escalation the same way. Um, so what might work for one person on the autism spectrum is certainly not going to work for everybody. If, and the saying, of course, is if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Um, there's no known cause. If you ask the CDC, it's caused by environmental, biological, and genetic factors, so everything. Um, and there's really no known cure. There's no pill that, that's developed um, uh, to cure autism. So um, we'll keep going. Uh, prevalence statistics. The most recent statistics uh, that were brought out by the Centers for Disease Control last year uh, were one in 59 children identified with an autism spectrum disorder. Um, one in 38 boys on the national average. Here in our state, we're at one in 50 children, uh, and the national average is one in 38 boys, and in Maryland, it's one in 131. Uh, one in 31, excuse me. It's four times more common in boys uh, than it is in girls. It's one in 139 in our state, in Maryland for girls. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there are fewer girls on the autism spectrum. Girls sometimes get diagnosed later. Uh, it presents sometimes differently because of social interactions and social development. Um, so sometimes girls get later diagnosed at a later age, uh, where I think the later age for girls is somewhere to almost five or six sometimes, where boys, the average age for diagnosis is usually closer to two and a half or three years old. So those are the most recent prevalent statistics. And if the one statistic to take off of there that's important is to notice is that the number is based on children. So when the CDC does this study, they take a photo snapshot of one particular group of children. And in this case, it was eight-year-olds uh, in certain schools, and they were looking at their IEPs for autism diagnosis. So this isn't taking into account younger children or older people or adults or people who have co-diagnosis. So getting a real handle on the prevalence statistics is tough because there's no real number for adults diagnosed. Um, because the diagnoses have changed so much over the last 20, 25 years alone um, that it's being diagnosed a lot more. But those are the most recent numbers that have come out uh, from the CDC. This is sort of an old autism spectrum model, but we still go back to it. They don't diagnose people any longer with, uh, with Asperger's syndrome or with uh, pervasive development disorder not otherwise specified. Those were taken out of the, of the diagnostic manual when they did the most recent version of it and everything is diagnosed now as autism spectrum disorder. Uh, but I still use the terminology when I present because it's, it's, it's the terminology that's still going to be on people's IEPs who are, who are older. They're not taking it off of people's uh, medical charts or IEPs or things like that. So we still talk about it. Um, typically Asperger's syndrome, a milder form, sometimes associated with high IQ, but could be normal to high uh, IQ may not need as many supports to go through daily life, daily activities, but really sometimes struggle greatly with social interaction, knowing how to start a conversation, understanding sarcasm, um, not being able to stop themselves from saying the thing you're not supposed to say when you're not supposed to say it, uh, because the question might not have made any sense. Uh, I have a coworker and her son is diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, uh, and he's a brilliant young man. And when I met him and he was eight years old, he started to tell me about he was working on inventing bone regeneration. And this was an eight-year-old child. And I was playing with matchbox cars when I was eight. And this kid's talking about inventing bone regeneration. And he's a bright, bright young man. And he's now 15, 16 years old. Uh, he's telling me he's going to go to MIT and study quantum physics. He wants to make movies like Tim Burton. 
uh, but he struggles so much socially. He struggles so much seeing the other side of the coin in an argument and being able to give at all in any sort of conversation. He tells us he really struggles fitting into a group. He doesn't know how to even act interested in something you're talking about if he doesn't care about it. And if you're going to talk about something he cares about, he's going to want to be the one to lead the conversation and be the expert on it and has a hard time coping with the stress and the anxiety that that creates. So uh, his day is divided up at the school where he goes into achieving academically and achieving behaviorally. Uh, and if he doesn't achieve his goals for the day, he doesn't he doesn't get that software time that he wants so badly when he gets home to create the movies he likes to create. And he had a Tuesday like a month ago, behaviorally, that was just horrendous in the morning and knew whatever he was going to do the rest of the day. He wasn't going to earn the reward at the end of the day. And that's not an acceptable option to him. So he got onto his laptop at school and he hacked the school's communication system and he shut down the communication system for the entire school so that they couldn't get in touch with mom. Uh, and let her know that he hadn't achieved his goals for the day. He got caught. Uh, they had mom's cell phone number. They had cell phones. They got in touch with mom. Um, so the plan didn't work. But part of that is that impulsivity that comes with a disability, like autism spectrum disorder, where part of your brain is supposed to come up with a plan like that. But there's another part of your brain that's supposed to go, yeah, that's a great idea. We're not doing that. Um, let's not plan that. Let's not try and do that. But that impulsivity sometimes is a struggle. Uh, for people, and it gets makes people make some questionable decisions and say some questionable things sometimes. So uh, he may go on to MIT and be an absolute brilliant scientist or make amazing movies, but it's going to be tough unless he struck unless he learns to get over that struggle with social interaction, where he's going to have to learn to have a conversation and take other people's criticisms or advice, because there's very few jobs in the world where you can go through where you don't have to listen to anybody else's opinion. Um, so some of that social skills stuff is going to be his real struggle. All the way at the other end of this arrow is someone I, I sort of pictured when Max was diagnosed, uh, and my son is somewhere in between these two arrows. Um, uh, but my, my coworker, I have another coworker, there's eight of us who work in our office, and five of us uh, have loved ones who are impacted by autism. Um, and she's got, my, my other coworker has a son, and this is her son, and his name's Eric, and he's He's 26 years old and he's a brilliant young man. And he, uh, he is uh, headphones on, uh, hoodie on, headphones over the hoodie, uh, maybe carrying his iPad, uh, low verbal, not a whole lot of eye contact. Um, we call it singing, vocalizing, e -e -e -e, over and over again. Uh, and I bring Eric with me when I go and train medical personnel and medical school students and doctors and nurses and I bring the, the doctor, the top doc or the nurse up into the front of the room and I say, you know, your next patient's coming in, they're on the autism spectrum, I need you to get me a name and a phone number. And I bring Eric up to the front of the room and Eric stands there uh, and the doctor will come up and they'll say, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? And Eric doesn't respond. Eric is looking around, Eric's yawning, Eric's starting to wander away. And as the doctor goes on, eventually their voice goes higher. What's your name? Well, we never said Eric was hard of hearing, but the voice goes louder. And eventually they start talking to him like he's a child. What's your name? Hey, buddy, what's your name? Hey, are you listening? What's your... And as soon as that starts to happen, Eric gives him a dirty look and walks away. Because Eric is a 26-year-old man. And this doctor was judging Eric based on the way his disability was projecting out and not presuming intellect. And we're always preaching to presume intellect everywhere we go because eventually someone says, well, can you write it down for him? And if you write down the message, what's your name? And you show it to Eric on a piece of paper, Eric takes the paper and the pencil and writes, my name's Eric Kane, what's your name? Because Eric's not gonna communicate verbally. And we're trying to always get people to remember that <clears throat> not everybody communicates the same way. Communication can be difficult verbally. Um, to always consider other forms of communication. And it's very important to presume intellect because uh, the amount of support somebody needs has nothing to do with their IQ. There's no correlation on a my arrow chart here between IQ and the amount of support somebody needs. So that individual that might be flapping and not looking at you or rocking themselves, um, and you may think to yourself, well, they're not gonna be able to communicate. I'm not gonna be able to get information from them. There's no point in talking to them that's not fair to that individual and you should presume intellect and, and, and talk to them like they're a 26 year old person if that's how old they are 
And if you have to come down and meet them where they are, think of some other forms of communication. Um, that's what you do. But we always want to start things off on that positive interaction. So presume intellect when you're talking to somebody. So one of the young women that we know who is an individual on the autism spectrum, um, she said, I'm not a dot on a line. Just because you can put me up at the one end of the line doesn't mean I don't struggle with my disability in other ways. Uh, and so she said, I like to be looked at like this. And I like to be, um, you know, look at my different strengths and my different weaknesses. And that way you could sort of see uh, where, I, where I can do the best and where I can succeed. Uh, and all of these can change depending on different things, whether you're feeling well or you're not feeling well or how much sleep you get. But this particular chart uh, describes a young man who works at my office and his name is Quinn. And Quinn is a 24 year old young man who came to us from high school. He was an intern for us coming out of Four Bush High School. Uh, and then we ended up hiring him when he went to his adult day program and he works about 10 hours, 12 hours a week for us doing data entry. Uh, and this sort of charts Quinn. So the closer to the middle the dot is, the more impacted they are by that particular quadrant of the chart. Um, so Quinn is a say hello, say goodbye kind of guy, not a lot of language, uh, not a lot of communication verbally, um, struggles motor skills wise, can't tie his shoes, horrible handwriting, can't open bottles, things like that. Um, sensory processing was a real struggle for Quinn. It used to be every half an hour, he would have to take a break and go under a weighted blanket. Uh, and then after about 10 minutes, he would come back out and get back to work. And we realized that um, the reason he had to take that break was because the laptop he was working on was freezing. Uh, and he doesn't have the words to say, hey, my laptop's broken. Can someone help restart this? I am, I'm sort of stuck here. He would advocate to his job coach for a break. He would take the break under his weighted blanket, which helps him reduce his anxiety, that deep pressure of the weighted blanket. And after 10 minutes, the computer had unfrozen itself and he could come back and go back to work. It was a brilliant workaround. Uh, but what we ended up doing was we ended up buying him a new laptop. And he hasn't been under the weighted blanket for about four years because he can't go faster than the laptop. Um, but now that I'm saying that it's four years and it's a laptop, I know that it's going to be slowing down again soon. But if, if all you're seeing are those top dots, the language and the motor skills and the sensory processing, and that's the person you're judging based on the way their disability is impacting them, you may miss that one key skill where that person can be, can thrive, a passion they're gonna have, a strength they're gonna exhibit, that's gonna make them a valuable employee, that's gonna make them helpful uh, to be able to communicate with in a doctor's office or any kind of setting or even at home. So for Quinn, I'm not gonna put Quinn on phones, answering phones for me because he doesn't, he struggles so much verbally, but when it comes to data processing and entry and executive function skills and his ability to learn software quickly, uh, there's nobody better in my office. Uh, when I sit down with Quinn with a new project, I've, I've written out some simplified directions uh, using easy to understand language. Uh, and we go over it and I role play it, I role model it to him, he role models it back to me and he, and he gets up and he goes and he's great and he's a fantastic member of our team. So we always wanna look for that strength, that passion, that way that you're gonna be able to work with an individual or interact with that individual in your life. Individuals on the autism spectrum typically struggle with communication, sensory processing, uh, social interaction and behavior. And that's when we go around and we divide up our presentation into one of those four sections. So um, we're gonna jump into our first exercise, which uh, the first exercise, and like I said, this is what I do in front of audiences as well, in front of live people, as opposed to just Renee in an empty conference room. But uh, if you saw on the last slide, it said, raise your right hand at the top. Now, I don't know if anybody out there listening has their right hand in the air, but I know that from experience, uh, nobody in the audience ever puts their right hand up. And when I ask people, did you see it? And they'll admit to seeing it, but they don't do it. And I ask them why. And most, many times it's, well, you didn't tell me, and I thought you were going to cover it, and I didn't want to interrupt you. And, and what I try and reinforce to people is, listen, you're going to present information to people throughout your life and throughout your day with police officers or doctors or teachers or parents, you're gonna say things and you're, you're gonna want the loved ones in your life to listen and pay attention, but you're assuming that everybody's communicating the same way and not everybody communicates the same way. I know that Trisha's son, Eric, had he seen this slide, would have his right hand in the air because why else would I have it on the page if I didn't want you to do it? My son, Max, never would have put his hand in the air because I didn't say it. 
and, I, and he, 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 that's how he processes communication. So don't assume that just because you've given somebody a piece of information that they've heard you, understood all the words you were using, have figured out how to give you the answer you're looking for, uh, and give you that answer, or even ask for clarification, uh, because it can be confusing. Language and thought processing can be confusing. Um, so the other thing that we like to do when we're in front of audiences and we figured out a way maybe this works on our webinar, we'll see how it goes, um, is I was reading, uh, uh, we bring up, excuse me, we bring up uh, a member of our audience and I have a bucket of ping pong balls. And I say to you, take, uh, I'm gonna ask you a question and I want you to reach into my bucket of ping pong balls and I want you to read the answers on the ping pong balls until you find the right answer to my question. So I'll say to my, my, my person who comes up, my brave volunteer, okay, uh, read me your, get me your address out of the bucket of ping pong balls. And they start to read off answers to me. And the answers don't really have anything to do with the questions I've asked them. And as they give me more answers that don't make any sense, I start to try and increase the anxiety on them. Why aren't you answering my question? I didn't ask you about last Tuesday. Nobody cares about Ocean Eleven. I'm trying to find out what your address is. Why don't you understand my question? Why aren't you giving me the answer I'm looking for? Why are you being so difficult? And I keep going and I keep going until eventually we get to the answer on the ping pong ball. And what I try and have them understand is that everybody processes thoughts differently. There's an amazing book called The Reason I Jump. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to read it, I highly recommend it. It's a great story uh, written by a young Japanese boy who communicates through his word processing device. Uh, and they asked him, he's very aware about his, his disability and how it impacts him. And they said to him, how come it takes you so long to answer questions? Because that's one thing we're going to talk about is communication processing, language processing. And he said, all of your thoughts in your head are lined up like a Rolodex. So when you say, Neil, what's your address? My mom flips to an index card in my head that's got my address, my work address, my mom's address, the address where I came to present today. And it's all neatly organized. I'm able to access it quickly. So I'm able to give you an answer quickly. Well, this young man described his thoughts floating around in his head like dots in space. And every time he's asked a question, he has to go grab one of those dots that's moving around and read the answer off of it and see if it answers your question. And if it does, anxiety relieved, I don't have to answer, I don't have to think, he's gonna give you answers that don't make any sense. And as that goes on, anxiety grows up, goes up, because people are firing more questions at them. How come you're not answering me? Why aren't, I'm waiting for your answer. Parents bugging kids um, and things like that hammering kids with questions. I know my kid used to get really stressed out in my car when I would pick him up from school and I would start going with, how was school? How was history? How was soccer? Did you play trumpet today? And he would just get very upset with me and anxiety would go up. And one day I slowed things down for him and gave him time to answer questions and it made things easier for him. Occasionally another thought will come out like I have a headache or I need to clean up. But communication is difficult. Communication can be verbal and nonverbal. 30 to 50% of the autism population is considered low verbal or nonverbal. Uh, te technology has been fantastic with helping individuals get their thoughts uh, into words. Text to talk technology has been great. Uh, but you're, there are still individuals who use things, sign language, gestures, um, and things like that. Individuals may be verbal, but unable to sustain a conversation. Um, I work with a young man uh, who comes into my office on Monday mornings and really struggles to understand the back and forth of a conversation. That's a social skills thing. You have to learn give and take when it's your turn, when it's turn to listen. And he struggles with that. Plus he gets a lot of anxiety being around the boss. And I guess I'm the boss in this situation. And when he comes into my office on a Monday morning, he doesn't feel comfortable with a typical conversation. He just lets to talk to me and he unloads all of his favorite facts to me about washing machines. And he'll go on and on and on because he doesn't get the back and forth piece. And Mr. Neal, did you know in 1938, the Bendix Corporation invented this, and the top loader is this, and the front loader is good for this, and the best pod is this. And I don't know anything about washing machines. I, I couldn't possibly interject anything into the conversation. He doesn't want me to interject anything into the conversation, but he can't stop himself because he doesn't know when and how. So what I like to do is give him the framework, the concreteness we talked about earlier of a schedule. And once he comes into my office on a Monday morning, I say, good morning, Nick. 
uh, you can tell me two things about washing machines this morning, and then I've got two jobs for you. And you can see him relax because I've given him the, the, the guidance that he wants, the, the, the schedule that he's looking for, the concreteness that lets him go about his day, and it takes the pressure off of him of knowing when to stop. So he says, good morning, here's my two facts. Okay, Nick, go do, do these two jobs. Come back when you're done. I've got, you can tell me two more. I'll give you two more jobs. And he likes that. It broke it down. It made it easier for him. It took some of the weight off of his shoulders. Um, I always caution, though, you know, stick to what you say, because if I tell him, you can tell me two facts, and after the first fact, I say, okay, here's your two jobs. Go do them. Well, it, it may be tough to get him to do those jobs because I've just broken that little verbal contract we had. Um, and he may go do it because he likes me. Um, but in the back of his head is going to be a little bit of anxiety going, why couldn't I say that second thing? I really have a second fact to tell him. And, and that may build in him and cause him to struggle. Um, but it works for him. Uh, and it makes it a little bit easier. It's that reasonable accommodation we always want to look for. Um, my son cites scripts. My son has all the words, um, but really hates having conversations with people. He really, there's a lot of anxiety for Max in coming up with language and the appropriate things to say. Um, so what he does have, one of his great gifts is he has an amazing memory. And what he does is he memorizes movies and videos and YouTube videos and cartoons and memorizes the dialogue in them. And what he's most comfortable doing is finding his words in the words of others. So he's perfectly capable of having a conversation with you, always plugging in different movie scripts because they fit somewhat. It's a comforting thing for him. And unless you know the movie the way he does, you'd have no idea. And I see him talk to people and I listen to the conversation and eventually the person who was talking to Max will say, well, what a great conversation. We just had a great talk. And I laugh because I'm like, that whole thing was from Toy Story 2. And unless you've seen Toy Story 2 a thousand times and rewound the same script a thousand times, you'd have no idea. Unless you ask Max a question he doesn't have a script for, and then he just turns around and walks away from you. Because he doesn't have the thing to say, and to think of something that's the correct answer or appropriate causes too much anxiety, so he's going to walk away. If he really wants to talk to you, um, he's going to say, no, no, here's your next line. And he'll tell you what to say so he can keep the back and forth going. Uh, again, there's another side to it because he recognizes the emotions in people's words. So he uses that where if he hears a character in a movie say to another character, uh, you do it yourself, you stupid, lazy jerk. That's something that Max will bank in his memory bank is, well, that's what you say when you're mad. So when I yelled down to my son last night at 9.30, uh, please turn off the four different electronic devices you're playing on. Uh, it's time to come upstairs and read a book and shower and get ready for bed. Uh, he yells up at me from the basement, you do it yourself, you stupid, lazy jerk. So again, he knows all the words. So I've heard lots of things get yelled up at me from the basement. So I sort of let that roll off my back. But I know my kid and my kid hates coming up with those thoughts right on the spot. So he relies on his movie scripts. And if he had the words, I'm sure my typical 15-year-old would say, you know, Dad, I just need five more minutes with this Lego tower, and I'll be sure to do everything you're asking me to do, right? I'm sure he would say that. No. For my son, it's what would the guy in the movie say when he's mad? Dad's asking me to do something I don't want to do. That makes me mad. That's what comes out. In my house, it rolls off my back now. Not always, but it does now. But again, this kind of stuff comes up. He gets angry at a mall or a shopping center or a restaurant or a movie theater. That same kind of language is going to get screamed because that's the go-to of what you say when you're angry. In my house, two minutes later, he's walked upstairs doing everything I wanted him to do. Um, but when you're in a public environment and it creates more anxiety, you could see how it could escalate. So uh, that's citing scripts. Echolalia is the repetition back of the last thing you may have said as a form of communication. Uh, my friend Eric, who trains with me, who struggles verbally, if you say, Eric, do you want chicken or pizza? Pizza. Okay, well, do you want pizza or chicken? Chicken. So he's just going to repeat back the last thing you said. So again, thinking outside the box, not everyone communicates the same way. So you write down for Eric, pizza or chicken. When he was little, my coworker would cut out the pictures of the food they would have for dinner to give him choices so he could visually look at it and point to what they want. 
Um, so thinking of other ways to communicate information other than verbally uh, oftentimes has to come into play because uh, I'll, I'll always go back to it, and I go to it a lot today, is that, 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 that anxiety creates behavior. Um, so I'm always trying to think of ways to keep anxiety down. Individuals may use repetitive or idiosyncratic language, going back to words that are comforting, not hard to think about, um, and we'll just repeat phrases over and over again. Uh, I know if my son starts on, on a certain phrase from a certain Thomas the Tank Engine show he knew from years ago. So if I hear my son going, you're causing me confusion and delay about anything, I know he's starting to get stressed out and that's his anxiety. And he'll repeat that phrase over and over again to try and relax himself. Uh, but I use it as a sign that I know he's starting to get worked up. So whatever I can do to help him, uh, I go to and do at that point. That's an example of picture exchange cards that people have used before. Important to remember to use direct language. Uh, don't say in 10 words what you could say in five. Uh, don't assume that everybody understands all the words, phrases, expressions, euphemisms, idioms that we all think are pretty common knowledge and easy to understand, but they can be very confusing to people. Um, you may get answers from individuals that seem blunt or tactless. Uh, think about the question you've asked. Uh, and, and how it could be interpreted and how it could be misinterpreted. So uh, what one of my trainers who works with me says is uh, don't ask a person on the autism spectrum if you look fat in a dress, if you're not prepared for an honest answer. Because why else would you be asking the question? Otherwise, why would you ask it if you don't want the answer? You're asking me this question, so I'm going to give you an honest answer. Because for some people who are real good rule followers and strict rule followers who learn that lying is wrong, a little white lie, which is what would be called for in that situation, is never going to occur to them. So you could certainly see where that information uh, could be confused. Um, you know, if you ask that same person, do you like my shoes? And they say, you look fat. That's a different story. But that's not a misinterpretation of the question. But think of the question you're asking and, and the language you use. Um, an example for it was, uh, I'd been working for Pathfinders for a little bit. Uh, and we were reached out to by an adult co-ed day program. Um, in Baltimore who was having some issues with the clientele who were getting maybe a little touchy feeling and they didn't like that with their clientele. You can't have that going on in your day program. Uh, so she said, can you get me a police officer from Baltimore County to come out and talk to my clients about good touch, bad touch, appropriate, inappropriate. I said, sure. The officer comes out and we sit down and I'm going to say to the officer, let me just talk to you a little bit about your audience. And all I'm going to do is go over what's on this slide with them, you know, simplify language, use terminology that's easy to understand. And he was very confident and he said, no, I don't, I don't need your help, Neil. I do this all the time. And I said, well, that's great. But let me just talk to you about your audience. For a minute. No, no, I don't need your help. I got this. And he walks in and he starts to talk and hands go up from the clients. And the first question is, where is it okay to touch a woman? And the officer goes, he's got his, his canned response ready. Anywhere she's covered by a bathing suit, you can't touch her. And I looked at their program director and I said, that's vague. Uh, so let's see what happens. And all the hands go up. So if she's in a bikini, because my literal thinkers understand, covered by a bathing suit, being covered in a bikini, her stomach's not covered, I can touch her there. Top of her chest isn't covered, I can touch her there. Backs of her legs, inside of her thigh. None of that's covered by a bathing suit. And the officer's like, well, you know, that's sort of a gray area. And I put my head in my hands and I went, oh no. And the hands go up and it's, why is she gray? And how old are they before they go completely gray? And how do I, what am I going to go gray if I touch a gray woman? And I don't understand that. And the officer stumbles his way through. And at the end of it, he says to me, what would you have said? And I said, well, I would have talked to you beforehand and told you that these are good rule followers. These are adults who have pretty, pretty minimal day support, minimal support. They're able to do things on their own and work on projects and go out in the community with little, with, with, with minimal support. So they're good rule followers. Let's lay down the rule, first of all, because we're going to get to social skills rules are important and hard to pick up sometimes. So maybe that rule of you don't touch anybody without permission, keep your hands to yourself, uh, especially here. That's the one that's going to be reinforced by the law, by home where they're or wherever they're living, by the program where they're at. And for the other thing, I would have just said, draw a box in the air, picture a box in your head that covers her from head to toe. And you don't touch anything that's covered by that. 
because that's an easier visual image. That's an easier thing to imagine to save some picture you're under a blanket and the blanket covers them completely and don't touch anything under there because to say a gray area implies that you understand the nuances of color change between black and white and that's a subtle thing that not everybody understands the words so here's another example you know what did i tell this little boy what was the what did i say to him that would result in this and i told him to take a seat so that's what he did and it's cute because he's looking he's a little thing he's maybe three or four years old he probably doesn't understand what that means but I always project things for my kid. I know my son. My son's a literal thinker. And if I say to Max, take a seat, his answer is picking up a chair because you said take it. Where am I taking it? There's a much easier way to get this little boy to do what I want him to do without risking that confusion or that misunderstanding. And I could just say to him, sit down, sit down in the blue chair. All of that is easier to understand and harder to misinterpret because we don't the misinterpretations lead to sometimes negative interactions because my 15 year old in school is told to take a seat and he picks up a chair. Ha ha, you're being very funny. You're the class clown. Uh, I've talked to police officers and law enforcement. And I've said, what are you going to do if you tell a guy take a seat and he picks up a chair? And to them, that could be, oh, you're being smart aleck. You're belligerent. You might be intoxicated, but it may not be that. It may not be that someone's being difficult. It may just be they don't understand the words you're using and they may never ask for clarification. It wouldn't make sense to Max to ask for clarification. You said, take a seat. There's no other meaning for that in his head. Because if you meant sit down, you'd say, sit down. So using that clear language sometimes can really help. Here's another example with our friend Kyla. What did we say to her? Well, we told her it was time to hit the road. So that's what she's doing. And we certainly didn't mean that, but using that clear language that's easier to understand, Kyla, get in the car, we've got to go. Kyla, it's time to go. Uh, Kyla, get your coat, we're leaving. Any of those things would be easier than using an expression that you're just making the assumption that somebody understands. Uh, the first time I ever said to Max, okay, let's roll, he came rolling across the living room floor to me. Uh, and I said, okay, well, we're gonna have to use much clearer language to make sure you understand what I want. Um, but that's the kind of thing we're talking about, using that clear language to avoid misunderstandings. Uh, receptive and expressive language is what we sort of talk about, the amount of time it takes to process information. Um, and that takes longer for some individuals on the autism spectrum, sometimes for up to 20 seconds, uh, just to process and answer one question. So we're going to sit here quietly. I can't make my little stopwatch slide work, but I'm getting my stopwatch up on my phone. I really am, Renee can vouch for me. Uh, and we're gonna sit quietly for 20 seconds because that's how long it takes some individuals just to process the answer to one question. That's 10 seconds. And that's 20 seconds. And that's to answer one question. And if you ask another question, the clock starts over. And if you ask another question, anxiety is gonna go up because you haven't answered the first question and now you're being asked the second question. And when anxiety goes up, we're gonna talk about behaviors come up, but it also reduces language and thought processing. Um, and it becomes harder to come up with answers to questions especially if it's that ping pong ball thing where you're trying to grab the questions, but you're just hammering me and answering me with questions. And again, with Max, I always picture him older. Maybe I'm not around one day. Maybe he's at an adult day program or he's at a college and he wanders off and he gets lost, uh, God forbid. And, and a police officer comes up and finds him or somebody comes up and finds him and starts firing questions at him. What's your name? What are you doing here? Where's your ID? What's your phone number? Why are you in this place? Why aren't you in... And I know my son, his anxiety will go through the roof because he can't come up with the things to say. He's going to say something rude, tell you where to go. And he's going to turn around and take off running in the opposite direction because uh, he's not going to want to talk to you. He's going to want to escape. Um, and that's dangerous. I mean, we certainly don't want him doing that if we're working with law enforcement. Uh, and we don't want him doing that at a school. We don't want him doing that wherever he is. So giving people time to process the questions you're asking them, letting them have their 20 seconds. Max would sometimes take 16, 17 seconds to answer a question, but it let him 
think it through, figure out the right answer. And I wasn't just firing questions at him and it makes it easier for him to understand. So things to think about, simplifying your language, offer different choices, whether it's visually, verbally, um, giving a person another way to communicate if they're not gonna communicate verbally, sign language, typing it out on a computer or a device, uh, anything that works, making sure you have resources for people to respond uh, in multiples, multiple ways. So if your child's not responding verbally, have that notepad handy, give them your notes on your phone or an iPhone or an iPod so they can type things out maybe to make it easier. Um, slow your questions down, giving time for people to respond. Uh, my son likes to ask lots of questions when he's anxious, when he's at the doctor's office, he wants to know what the numbers on the blood pressure meter mean. He has no idea what systolic and diastolic numbers mean, but as long as the woman doing it starts talking about it and explaining it in her own words, he, his anxiety goes down. When the person ignores his questions and acts like he's not even there while he's asking them, his anxiety goes through the roof. So run, keeping a running commentary with my son when he's asking you questions helps keep his anxiety down. But again, like we talked about with Nick, I'm pointing to the screen, like everyone can see me pointing to the screen. Um, but like we talked about with Nick, giving that framework for people, letting them know um, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate can help. So I focus a lot on communication. Communication is a big piece to me because I think that's where a lot of the misunderstandings take place. Uh, but sensory processing is a big deal also. Your brain's ability to process uh, the sounds, the smells, uh, the textures that you feel or see um, going through your day. Uh, sitting in an empty conference room is pretty low anxiety, but I know that I can hear the fluorescent light bulbs in here have a certain buzz to them, and I'm watching outside the window, and I see the trees moving around in the breeze, uh, and I'm aware of Renee sitting next to me, and I'm always a little bit warm, and all of these things my brain is processing while I'm talking to the laptop, uh, and I'm able to keep it going, um, but when you struggle with sensory processing difficulties, and some of those sounds are so loud they're painful, or the bright light coming in from outside is causing you pain, or the smell in the room is so so horrible to you, or the, or the carpet is pulsating because of the pattern in the carpet, it's hard to process information. It becomes an anxiety situation, and sometimes that happens. So this is just a video that was drawn up, was recorded by a young man out of England about what maybe just like a typical trip to the mall may be like. Maybe. Wow. It's supposed to go faster than that, so it's going to buffer for a second. So that may not work, but it, it, it's, it's uh, an opportunity for this young man walking through the mall and all the different smells and sounds and noises uh, and all those different things that are, that are bombarding him at the same time, perfume being sprayed, uh, people asking you questions and getting in your way, the different uh, lights, the way they're coming in through the mall. Uh, he does a little counts to 10 to try and uh, ease his ease his anxiety, um, but eventually it gets to be too much and he ends up being a little boy who's melting down in the middle of the, of the mall. Um, and he says, I'm not naughty, I'm just autistic and I'm getting too much information at one time. Uh, and it can be very difficult. Um, and again, you know, we're at the Maryland School for the Blind, so then you take away one of those senses and how intense it can be walking through a mall and all of that bombarding you when you don't know what it's, what's causing it, what it's coming from. So you could certainly see where that sensory processing piece can lead to a lot of anxiety. Uh, and it just does get to be too overwhelming. And that's what leads to a lot of meltdowns and behaviors that some people see. Um, like we talked about, it's a sensitivity to sound, light, touch, smell, taste. Uh, individuals can get easily overstimulated a lot of times. Uh, that leads to meltdowns. Sometimes you go into those de-escalation things that help techniques like the deep pressure that somebody might feeling having a preferred object that they can go to having a quiet space i know at all of our events we make sure we've got a quiet space so if things get to be too much come into our quiet room it's low lighting it's low sound you have the ability to decompress because things can be too intense um, but you never know until you go into a situation how it's going to be so you a lot of parents a lot of times are have scoped it out and know where to go things to carry noise canceling headphones um, and things like that oftentimes are very helpful. You may see individuals clapping their hands together or, or hitting themselves on a part of their body, not self-injuriously, but giving themselves sensory stimulation. One of the young men who works in my office uh, bangs himself against the wall gently 
He's not putting holes in the drywall or hurting himself, but he's giving himself a little sensory input when he feels he needs it. It helps his anxiety uh, and it can be a lot easier for him. Body awareness, knowing where your body fits into a space uh, is also a sense, proprioception, as well as your balance, the part of your body, your brain that knows uh, up from down is called your vestibular system. And that's also one of the senses that's impacted by people who struggle with sensory processing difficulties. Now, you don't have to have autism to have sensory processing difficulties. It's just a common thing in individuals with autism as well. Um, for my son, the feeling of wet clothing against his skin is extremely painful to him. So uh, an Under Armour compression shirt is horrible for him. It's too tight on his skin. Um, a swim shirt would be a nightmare for my son. Having something like that on is horrible. It doesn't bother him to go in a pool with a bathing suit. That doesn't bother him against his skin. But if you were to spill a cup of water on him where he's wearing sweatpants or a t-shirt, he's going to, he used to immediately just strip off that layer of clothing. Uh, he's gotten much better. Uh, he's learned to be more flexible with it through the years and through lots of trial and error. But he will now, if you ever see a little kid in a restaurant pulling his clothing as far away from his skin as you can, um, that may be Max, who may have spilled something on his shirt. Um, but he's learned to cope with it. But it's a real sensitivity to where it hurts so much for him to have it against his skin um, that it creates behavior. Uh, and a child who doesn't have the ability to, or an adult who doesn't have the ability to communicate the pain they're in will often strip their clothes off if their clothes are causing them pain. Uh, and stripping your clothes off in school uh, is going to get you in a lot of trouble. Stripping your clothes off because your clothes are causing you discomfort because of sensory processing in the middle of a Chick-fil-A will get you in a lot of trouble. Um, and it does happen. And police have to respond when it's an adult stripping their clothes off in a Chick-fil-A. And a lot of times when you ask police, what are you thinking on the way into that call? It's gentlemen on drugs, PCP. Um, and, and you can see how negative interactions can take place because they're not going to immediately think, hmm, I wonder if they're struggling with their sensory processing. But that may be what it is in, the, in that kind of case. Um, so it is something that creates anxiety, which creates behavior. Um, we're going to talk about social interaction. That's one of the th four things we talked about at the beginning. Uh, and again, social interaction is a common thing, happens every day, all day. Uh, it's very rare that you're going to have an opportunity to have no social interaction with anybody. But picking up social skills rules, which I've heard have been called invisible rules, can be really difficult because you don't know you break a social skills rule until you break it. And you get the reaction of people saying, oh my God, you shouldn't say that, you shouldn't do that, you don't do that here, that's not appropriate. But if it's not explained to you, and it doesn't mean that I, if I explain a social skills rule to my son once, he's gonna be like, got it dad, we're good forever. It's something we repeat over and over again. Uh, and I use my direct language to try and get it across to him what is appropriate and what's not, but it is something that needs to be repeated. Uh, it comes into play with personal space. Uh, it, my son loves to hug, um, but hugging is not an appropriate greeting for everyone. Uh, not everybody is looking for a hug. Uh, and there's a big difference between your when, when my son was five and would go up to hug every, my, hug, my son will hug women. He's not a big hugger of men. He likes to hug women. Um, and when he was little and he would go up and hug a woman, uh, he would go up and he would wrap his arms around her and he would bury his head into their chest and squeeze and hug them. And they would, nobody ever at five years old was, oh, that's not appropriate. Don't do that. Don't touch me. That's not, but my son is now 15 and 5'3 and 150 pounds. And he can't just go up and hug women that way. It's not appropriate. But my son doesn't get the difference between little Max and Max, who's 15 years old and is going through puberty and doesn't understand all the social skills rules uh, and doesn't understand that. Um, personal space is a thing that people take seriously. And again, I always picture my son as an older adult and he goes up and he wraps his arms around some woman because he thinks she's pretty or said hello to him and her boyfriend gets angry or whoever she's with gets angry and beats up my son or she calls the police because it's not appropriate. Um, and that kind of thing can happen. Personal space is hard to understand. Uh, reacting appropriately in certain situations is difficult to understand because those are all things that are social skills rules. And in times of anxiety, knowing how to react can be difficult. We can go back to personal space. If I'm coming this close to you, it's not appropriate. It's okay to have that vocal rule to say, Neil, you're too close. Let's talk from this far away and put your arm out and put your hand on my shoulder to say, this is how close we can talk. 
this is how comfortable I am. Sorry, I'll get that off the screen for everybody. Um, but it's okay to voice that social skills rule to somebody because they may not have heard that, or maybe they've only heard it 999 times and that thousandth time is what they need to get, okay, I need to start, this person wants me to stand this far away. I tell Max, high fives, not hugs. You can't hug everybody. You have to, but if you're not gonna hug somebody and they wanna hug, give them that uh, alternate form, that accommodation you can make where you say, listen, I don't like hugs. How about a high five? How about knuckles? Or my son calls it a pound dog. Or how about a wave? Or how about something that lets me say hello to you and acknowledge you, but not hug you? Because that's an important thing, but be consistent with your rules where you say, I don't like to hug, you can't hug the next time you see them because that breaks that understanding and it's gonna, you have to reinforce it all over again to be consistent. Because social interaction is difficult. Peer relationships are hard to develop when you don't understand the words everybody uses or understand the jokes everybody makes. Uh, it can be really difficult and hard to understand sometimes. Uh, we go, everything leads to behavior for me. So. This is, we get into some of the behavioral effects you may see when the anxiety goes up and the processing goes down and the social skills rules are hard to understand and that creates anxiety. Um, you may know people um, who, I hate the word obsessive. I like to think of them as people's passions, things they're fascinated by. These are things you'll be able to use or hopefully you'll be able to find uh, to be able to make that connection with somebody in your life or that you're working with or your child where, uh, look, my son most likely today is wearing a Baltimore Ravens shirt, uh, most likely carrying a bag of toys around. One of them's Mario Brothers, one of them's Pokemon. And right there you have three clues of fascinations my son has that you may be able to connect with him on. So maybe the first time he meets you, he doesn't want to talk to you or maybe really shy. But if you say, hey, Max, you like the Ravens? Well, great. He's going to go right into his comfort zone with you. And he's gonna, his anxiety is going to go down as he's able to tell you all the stuff he knows about football. And eventually you'll be able to start working some questions in where he'll be able to answer you back and forth because you've established that you're not someone creating anxiety. You're letting him talk about things he likes. So looking for things like that to help um, when people are struggling with behaviors. People may exhibit outbursts. Behaviors are anything from language to eloping to physical violence and things like that because sometimes things are just too overwhelming. Impulsivity, like we talked about, is a big part of it. Uh, I know those two bags of toys, if heaven forbid, uh, Max and I are in a car accident and he and I are on one side of a busy road and my car with his toys in it are on the other side of the busy road. He's going to take off to try and go get his toys because he's going to think that's the most important thing, <clears throat> excuse me, and not think about the danger of running off, running across the street. There's an impulsivity uh, that we talked about at the beginning that is common for individuals uh, with autism on the autism spectrum. You may see people repeat repetitive behaviors over and over again. That's like that verbal stimming. That's like Dev twiddling his bracelet. I don't know if that's an official word, but that's what we're using. Twiddling that bracelet at the beginning to help ease his anxiety, things to look for. I, I, always, I always want people to remember that behavior is communication and that the inability to communicate pain oftentimes will lead to behavior. We talked about that with sensory processing, but if you don't have the words to be able to tell somebody how much pain you're in, uh, you're going to exhibit behaviors uh, to try and ease that pain yourself, whether it's removing clothing or whether it's, you know, pushing in on a body part or, or hitting yourself in the head to try and ease your pain. I always tell families or professionals I, I talk to, if you see a new behavior, think about what it might be communicating. And I, it's oftentimes using those words when you see behaviors with somebody where you say, you know, what do you want? What are you trying to tell me? What can I do? What do you do when you feel this way? Might give them that opportunity to communicate with you in some way, shape, or form. Remember, always use alternate forms of communication if you have them, but giving them that opportunity to tell me where it hurts or how it hurts or what's wrong uh, to help out. Um, like I said, all behaviors should be seen as communication, rule out pain, that sensory overload. Can you turn the lights down? Can you turn the sound down in the room? Uh, can you make it a more sensory friendly environment to help reduce some of that anxiety, that frustration that comes sometimes from just changing uh, routine, from, from transitioning from one thing to another creates anxiety and frustration because, you know, I don't know when my favorite time, my, my time to do my favorite thing is going to be over. And when you tell me it's over, I have to do this thing I don't want to do. And I don't want to leave my favorite thing. And you can hear that anxiety starts to build. 
you know what? Use your communication again. Use your, for Max, I can't just go up and turn the modem off at the end of the night and say, you're done, because that's going to create a tremendous amount of anxiety for him as his electronics are taken away, especially after he's done everything he needed to do to be able to get his electronics time. But a bedtime is bedtime. So I have to give him, Max, you got 30 minutes and I'll set a timer. Max, you got 20 minutes and I'm letting him know as the clock goes down in increments so that he understands it's coming and that you're going to have to turn everything off to finish up everything you're doing, giving him time to get his head around the fact that he's going to move from one thing to another um, is just much easier for him. Now, it, it, he's still a 15-year-old. It doesn't mean he does it every time perfectly when I say zero, but there's way less uh, uh, aggravation, anxiety, aggression when I'm giving him that countdown so he knows it's coming. So try that. Using your timer, it's not hard to find a timer these days, whether it's on your phone or your microwave or your oven. It's easy to find a timer to be able to say and have that alarm goes off. And I and the expression in my house is when the duck quacks, because we use the duck quacking alarm on our phone, it's time to turn the electronics off. And I put it downstairs and I play it for him. And he's gotten pretty good at it. We let him know when it's coming. So use that. Try and use that to help ease behaviors. Um, this is like a 90 minute, two hour presentation that I'm sort of compressing because I want to get to our website. Um, this is our contact information. Uh, we're located in Hunt Valley. You're always welcome to walk in. You have my email right there on the screen and our website address, which is pathfindersforautism.org. Um, do you want to see if we can switch us back so we can show you the website? Oh, it's down there, right? There you go. So this is our homepage. Um, and we'll do a quick walkthrough just to show what I think are some of the really important highlights of it. Uh, I don't even know how we are on time, but we'll make sure we can get it out there for you. We're right there. Okay, good. So uh, one of the good, th great things on our website, this autism by age, uh, not a milestone checklist, sort of a things to think about checklist, uh, ideas about getting IEPs in order, financial planning. Have you thought about SSI or DDA? Have you applied for the autism waiver? All of those things are found in those sections and can certainly uh, be utilized. They're also printable in PDF form. So if you're a professional and you can use them and give them to parents or share them, you're welcome to them. Uh, tremendous amount of articles in this article section. We put out an article every month. If you don't follow us, if you're not part of our listserv, you can see right at the top, it says join our mailing list. You'll get a monthly email from us um, with one of our articles and you can see the variety of different subjects uh, that we've covered. Uh, and you click on any one of those headings over here, and they're going to open up into even more articles on that topic. We're very big on safety, great safety resources. Make sure you check that out. Uh, we were one of the leaders on uh, autism insurance, ABA being covered, applied behavior analysis being covered under insurance. Uh, our executive director was a key in that. Check out our insurance section. So this is my favorite thing that we have. This is our provider database. This is where... Uh, sort of the bread and butter of what it was started on uh, as a way for families to be able to find resources. So if you come down here, uh, you can put in the keyword for what you're looking for and it'll give you all the listings. But if, for example, I'm looking for a uh, speech therapist, you click on speech therapist, uh, I live over in Owings Mills, or we can just say Westminster, uh, and I'm gonna put in a 25 mile radius around that zip code and I click search. This is always the moment of truth. There we go. And it'll come up with a listing of different providers. We don't do recommendations because the speech therapist I love, another person may have had a horrible experience with and everybody's different. And what works for one person may not work for another. So I'm going to give you a list of 10 or whatever I have in my resource directory and you can search through it and you can do your due diligence and find out what you need. Um, and it's got, you know, 3,500 different listings for any number of different providers for a number of different services um, for what you need, sort of anywhere, as we say, along the spectrum of what you may need uh, for autism. But any kind of therapy, uh, we've got attorneys uh, for IEP issues, uh, the autism waiver provider list, the official list of people who are providers for the autism waiver, all kinds of great resources for behaviors but summer camps and day programs for adults, all kinds of great stuff on here. 
Uh, it's a very deep website. It's, you know, 300, 400 pages long. So you're not going to cover the whole website in one day. But bookmark it. Because when I, my kid was diagnosed, the doctor said, find some good resources local that are good, have good resources and information because just surfing the internet can be extremely hazardous for a newly diagnosed parent or even someone going through it. So we are a lifespan organization. Uh, we've got all kinds of different information in our resource directory. We've got great articles. We're all over social media. So feel free to reach out to us on any forum. Usually you're gonna get me on the phone. If you call into our helpline, it's 443-330-5341. Uh, and that rings directly to my desk. Uh, I wouldn't be doing my job. My development director would give me a hard time if I didn't say we live on donations and grants. All the money we raise stays in Maryland. So feel free to donate. Uh, sign up for our mailing list. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come out and present. I hope it's some information that's helpful. And I look forward to being able to work with Maryland School for the Blind in the future. Thanks, Renee. Awesome. Thank you, Neil. My pleasure. Glad to do it. Thanks. Learned a lot today.